Welcome to our next special topics lecture designed to help undergraduate students prepare for the organic chemistry sections of their standardized exams. Today we'll be pulling together several loose ends, so to speak, fundamental organic reactions and concepts that require coverage that I haven't yet addressed. Because I expect all who listen to this to already be nearing the end of their second semester of organic chemistry, I assume that all the material covered herein will be largely review for you. If such is not the case, then I invite any who watch this to watch any of my previous lecture videos on specific topics that you lack, or to consult additional material from your previous organic chemistry courses. After this lecture, you should know the reagents and be able to predict the products of the following. diels alder reactions, 1, 2, and 1, 4 additions to carbonyl compounds, and acid decarboxylations. Through all the reactions that we cover in organic chemistry, you may have noticed that very few of them involve forming carbon-carbon bonds. Why? Because, frankly, carbon-carbon bonds are often difficult to form. The reaction I'm about to teach you, called the diels alder reaction, is an extremely useful way of forming two new carbon-carbon bonds in a single transformation. To summarize, in a diels alder reaction, a conjugated diene, like this one, interacts with an alkene, which we call a dienophile in a diels alder reaction, to make a cyclohexene, like the one shown here. I'll now explain this reaction's mechanism, just so you know how this transformation actually occurs. During this reaction, our diene and our alkene, which we call a dienophile in a diels alder reaction, get close enough to each other that their pi electrons are arranged. That happens like this. And you can essentially think of it as being like the opening and closing of three doors on three separate hinges. Thus, these pi electrons, if you think of them as being a door attached to a hinge right at this carbon, swing out and close right here, forming a single bond between these two carbons. This door with a hinge right here swings over here to form a double bond between these two carbons. And this door with a hinge right here swings out and forms a single bond between these two carbons. As that occurs, it forms this product, which when redrawn in a prettier manner is this cyclohexene. There's a tremendous amount of variety that one can incorporate into the diels alder reaction. For example, if we use an alkyne as a dienophile instead of an alkene, then these electrons will do the diels alder rearrangement. Once again, we see the door flip on a hinge right here, this one flip down here, and that one flip here to form this type of product, which is a cyclohexadiene. There are two carbon-carbon double bonds in this ring. Now, similarly, we aren't limited to using unsubstituted dienes or dienophiles. Hence, we can begin with a diene and a dienophile that have a variety of different substituents, represented generically here as R1, R2, R3, and R4. To give multi-substituted cyclohexene or cyclohexadiene product. Alternatively, if we use a diene and a dienophile whose pi electrons are already pre-embedded in cyclic molecules, as in this example, then after the diels alder reaction occurs, we can get a polycyclic product. Once again, we could imagine any of these starting materials already being substituted in a variety of manners, which would allow a wide variety of substitution in our final product. Here are several examples of different diels alder reactions that we might do. If, for example, I reacted with my 1,3-butadiene with this compound called maleic anhydride, I would get this polycyclic product. This is a reaction that my organic chemistry students actually do in their organic chemistry lab. Similarly, I could react dienes with an alkyne, as in this example, to get this product, or with a uh, cyclic diene itself to give this intermediate. If this intermediate, which is also an alkene, could then behave as a dienophile in a subsequent diels alder reaction, we can get this tricyclic product. Now, since its discovery in the late 1920s, the diels alder reaction has probably been used to synthesize literally tens of thousands of molecules. 
Here's one example I thought I'd show you from Professor E.J. Corey's group at Harvard, which in 2004 reported treating molecule 6 called Dane's diene with dienophile 7 and chiral catalyst 8 to stereoselectively give product 9 with 94% enantiomeric excess and 92% yield. Over various other steps shown here, compound 9 was successfully converted into this final molecule known as estrone in an enantiopure form. Estrone is an estrogenic hormone of significance in numerous biological processes in females particularly, with specific relation to menopause. Diels alder reactions of cyclic dienes give particularly interesting products. For example, if we take cyclopentadiene right here and treat it with this dienophile, then like all of our Diels alder reactions, these electrons flip out here, forming a bond with carbon 1. These electrons swing over here to form a carbon carbon double bond between 2 and 3. And these electrons flip out here to form a carbon single bond between here and carbon 4 that ultimately provides this product. Now one thing you should notice is where the atoms in our cyclopentadiene starting material end up in our final product. I've numbered those atoms in both the starting material and the product in this slide for your reference. You can see in particular that atom 5 right here ends up right here in the product which is pointing towards us three-dimensionally on this slide. This is a little easier to see if we redraw the molecule to look like this. As you can see, carbon 5 ends up pointing up like this. This type of carbon in this unusual spirocyclic compound is known as a bridgehead carbon because it kind of looks like a little bridge between carbons 1 and 4. Now one thing that you should notice is that I've neglected to show how the stereochemistry ends up being at this position over here. Does the bond to our methyl ester right here end up going up or down in the product? In other words, should I draw this bond as being a wedge or a dash? The answer is both. In other words, we end up forming some of this product in which the ester is pointing down and some of this product in which it's pointing up. The product to the left is the major product being formed in 74% yield while the one at right is the minor product being formed in 26% yield. And just so you know, the product at left is called the endo product, and the one at right is called the exo product. So let's get to some problems. Foremost, I want you to identify the products of the following Diels-Alder reactions. And next, I want you to identify the diene and the dienophile that you would need to assemble this Diels-Alder product. I'm now going to readdress a subject we first encountered near the beginning of this semester, additions to carbonyl compounds. To reuse an analogy that I've shared before, I want you to imagine a happy man who happens to be a stick figure standing with this kind of posture. If this man gets hit in the groin with a football at high speed, then the product of that interaction would be this. Carbonyl compounds react much in the same way. Thus, if I have a carbonyl compound of this type and I have a nucleophile, it will come in like a football to the groin to this carbonyl carbon. However, in the case of our previous slide, the man getting hit with a football in the groin had nowhere to go except down. When a nucleophile comes into carbonyl carbon, in contrast, it can respond by having these pi electrons be thrust up onto the oxygen to give this intermediate. This intermediate is called a tetrahedral intermediate. Now if Y is an adequate leaving group, like a halide, an acetate, an OH, or an OR, for example, then the electrons up here on this oxygen can come down to reform a double bond and kick off Y, resulting in this type of product here. Now if Y isn't a good leaving group, like a hydrogen or an alkyl chain, as we would see in aldehydes or ketones, for example, then the O- minus cannot come down and kick that off. Instead, it just hangs around until it gets protonated when we quench the reaction. When I first taught you this generic mechanism back near the beginning of the semester, I warned you that it would be extremely repetitive, and I wasn't lying. 
In just a few moments, I'm going to summarize every carbonyl addition reaction you've ever learned by using a collection of just a few slides, which I've handwritten myself. As you should know, the original handwritten document, which includes an analogous summary of every undergraduate organic chemistry reaction I require my students to learn, is available to you in scanned form online. Before getting to that, however, I want you to remember that when you add something into a carbonyl, the better the leaving group, the more reactive the carbonyl compound will be. This idea can be seen on the following chart, which I've borrowed from the reference shown right here. Thus, because a chlorine is the best leaving group in the entire series, acid chlorides will be more reactive than acid and hydrides, which are more reactive than thioesters, which are more reactive than esters, which are more reactive than amides. This observation creates what should be some obvious consequences. For example, because a chlorine is a better leaving group than a nitrogen, I can easily add a nitrogen into an acid chloride to displace the Cl with a nitrogen group and thereby form an amide. But I can't go the other way around. In other words, I couldn't add a Cl minus into an amide and have the nitrogen get kicked off, leaving the Cl behind. Even if I were lucky enough to have the Cl minus come into the carbonyl, electrons would just go up onto the oxygen, and then they would come back down and kick off the chloride instead of the nitrogen, because a chloride is a much better leaving group. Thus, I can easily form an amide from an acid chloride, but not the other way around. A similar trend exists for the entire series. We can easily form functional groups that are below the functional groups that are above but not the other way around. Once again, to explain what that means, I could easily form an acid and hydride from an acid chloride, but it would be very difficult to go the other way around. Similarly, I could form a thioester from an acid and hydride, but I couldn't form an acid and hydride from a thioester, etc., etc. All of this is a consequence of the relative stability of the individual leaving groups that are highlighted here in green on these carbonyl compounds. So here is a summary of all of our carbonyl addition reactions. Thus, we can take an acid chloride, displace the Cl with an OR using hydroxide or just neutral alcohol to form an ester. Similarly, I can take an acid chloride and use an acetate or acetic acid of some type to generate an acid and hydride. I can take an acid chloride and treat it with uh, base or water and form a carboxyl acid, or I can treat it with an amine and generally, this has to require an excess addition of an, the amine to generate an amide. Continuing in the series, I can take an acid and hydride, treat it with an alcohol to generate an ester. I could treat it with water to generate two equivalents of carboxylic acid. Or I could treat it with an amine to generate an amide. I can also take an ester and treat it with uh, water and catalytic acid to form a carboxylic acid. I can take an ester and treat it with an amine to generate an amide. Or I can treat it with an alcohol to generate a different ester in which this R prime has been replaced with R double prime. This is uh, very important. This reaction is called a transesterification. This reaction, incidentally, is known as hydrolysis. And here are addition reactions of carboxylic acids. Thus, you can convert a carboxylic acid into an acid chloride by treating it with SOCL2, uh, better known as thionyl chloride, or PCL3. Now, you might be raising an eyebrow at this, but I promise I'll address it momentarily. We can also convert a carboxylic acid to an ester by reacting it with an alcohol and trace acid. This reaction is called Fischer esterification. This reaction works because an OH- minus is roughly just as stable as an OR-. minus. Thus, by treating our carboxylic acid with an excess of alcohol, and the electrons on the alcohol oxygen will come into the carbon carbonyl. Electrons go up, electrons go down, and they eventually kick off protonated OH to generate the ester. Thus, I end up replacing my OH with an OR. This reaction, of course, is reversible. Thus, if I wanted to take my ester and go backwards to a carboxylic acid, I could achieve that by just treating it with water and trace catalytic acid. The reverse process of this is, of course, known as hydrolysis, which I just showed you on the previous slide. 
Now you might be thinking right now, Mike, you just said that I can't displace one thing with another if the other is a better leaving group. So why in the world am I able to replace an OH with a CL? Now if you're thinking this, which I hope you are, then good. I'm about to answer it. Yes, an OH minus is a much crappier leaving group than a CL minus. That is an absolute fact. So it stands to reason that a CL, a chloride, could never come in here and kick off an OH minus, thereby replacing it. If a chloride went into carbonyl, you'd assume the electrons would go up, go back down and kick off the chloride, and not kick off the OH minus, because a chloride is a better leaving group. Nevertheless, this reaction still works. So how? How does it work? I'm not going to show you the full answer. I'll just tell you that these two reagents, thionyl chloride, or SOCL2, and PCL3, both convert the OH into a better leaving group than a CL. Thus, if you actually look at the mechanism of this reaction, which I can show you in class if you wish, you'll see that the reaction proceeds by a pathway that converts the OH into something else, which is a better leaving group than a CL. Once that occurs, then the CL comes in. Electrons go up, electrons go down, and they kick off the oxygen that's bound to something else. It's a better leaving group than a chloride. If you actually want to see this mechanism, once again, I can show you in class, or you can just look it up on the internet, which is what all you crazy kids do nowadays anyway. <laughs> so to continue, other things I can do is I can take a carboxylic acid and react it with an amine to generate an amide. This reaction is sped up by adding DCC, which is once again a reagent that also makes an OH a faster and better leaving group. I can displace nitrogens by treating them with aqueous acid and a ton of heat, thereby converting an amide into an OH. Now this is unusual because I am actually replacing uh, a nitrogen with something that's a better leaving group, an OH. So this is an unusual occurrence, but the reason that it's possible is because I add a tremendous excess of water, acid, and a buttload of heat. Similarly, I can take an amide and convert it into a nitrile by treating it with this dehydrating reagent known as phosphorus pentaoxide. I can also convert the OH into chloride with PCl3, which I just showed you, or into a bromide by treating it with phosphorus tribromide. Now we're going to get to the addition reactions into aldehydes and ketones with Grignard reagents. Now we've seen this in our previous slides. Thus, if I take a Grignard reagent, the R minus comes into the carbonyl, and because there's no good leaving group right here, I quench that with acid and it gives me a tertiary alcohol. Similarly, if I add a Grignard into an acid chloride, what ends up happening is electrons go up, then down, they kick off the chloride, I get a temporary ketone intermediate, but a second molecule of Grignard adds in again, ultimately giving me a tertiary alcohol also. Thus, I can't add a Grignard into an acid chloride and have it only add once. It will add twice to give me a tertiary alcohol. If I take a Grignard and I treat it with formaldehyde, the simplest aldehyde, I protonate that, I eventually get this, which is a primary alcohol in which I've essentially extended the CH2 by whatever alkyl group is bound to the magnesium in the Grignard reagent. I can also reduce carbonyl compounds. For example, if I take an aldehyde or a ketone and treat it with sodium borohydride followed by acid quench, I get this, which is either a secondary or primary alcohol depending on the starting material. This is once again very similar reaction. The hydride reagent, sodium borohydride, acts just like an H-, minus, which comes into the crotch of this carbonyl compound. Electrons go up and the alkoxide gets protonated to give me this product. Similarly, if I take an acid chloride and treat it under the same conditions, this uh, hydride reagent will add two successive H- minuses to give me a primary alcohol. Esters are less reactive than ketones, aldehydes, and acid chlorides. And thus, if I treat them with sodium borohydride, I get no reaction. If I want to reduce an ester, I have to use a more powerful reducing reagent, lithium aluminum hydride, which is the big guns of the hydride world. Two successive additions of H- go in to give me a primary alcohol. 
I can also take an acid chloride and treat it with lithium aluminum hydride that will add in two successive hydride reagents to give me the same primary alcohol. If I do want to take an ester and convert it just to an aldehyde, that is, just add one H minus N instead of two, I have to treat it with this bulkier hydride reagent called diisobutyl aluminum hydride, or dibol. Dibol at low temperature is able to add in just one H minus. Electrons go up, electrons go down, and they kick off the OR minus to give me my aldehyde. Similarly, if I take an amid and treat it with lithium aluminum hydride, I can reduce that. However, it doesn't reduce it to a primary alcohol. Instead, it actually ends up kicking off the OH to give me this primary amine. In fact, this amine could be secondary or tertiary, depending on the identity of the groups bound to the nitrogen. Similarly, if I take a ketone or aldehyde and I add a nitrile nucleophile, the electrons go in, electrons go up, and this O- gets protonated in the quench to give me this compound. I can also take a ketone or aldehyde and treat it with an amine to generate this compound, which is called an imine. Now, it's crucial to understand that to get an imine, I have to add a primary amine. The reason is because these two bonds to the nitrogen end up replacing the nitrogen's two bonds to these two hydrogens. If I take a carbonyl compound and treat it with a secondary amine like this one, what I actually get is an enamine. I can't have two bonds stably to the nitrogen here because that would give me positively charged nitrogen. So in fact, what I end up getting is a net oxidation retention at this carbonyl position giving me this double bond here. This is an enamine. Similarly, I can take my carbonyl compound, either an aldehyde or a ketone, and treat it with an n-hydroxyamine and get this compound, which is called an oxime. I can also take a carbonyl compound and treat it with uh, aqueous acid to generate this product, a hydrate. Similar conditions with an alcohol to generate an acetal or with a thiol to generate a thioacetal. Now this summarizes every single carbonyl addition reaction that we've covered this semester. I realize that it might seem daunting and it might seem like there are lots and lots of reactions, but what you can see is the unifying mechanism between all of them. The mechanism is identical. The only thing that's really different about them is the identity of the thing that we add. So once you learn that mechanism and see the commonality between all these reactions, you'll realize that you're not really learning 70 different reactions, you're just learning one with some alteration between each of the different circumstances. Now all of the carbonyl addition reactions we've discussed so far have been ones in which the nucleophiles added directly into the carbonyl carbon. As you can see here, that type of addition is called a 1-2 or direct addition. But what if we had an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl compound like this one, one in which there's a double bond conjugated into the carbonyl. Doesn't it seem possible that the nucleophile might add here instead of at the carbonyl directly? I hope you agree that the answer is yes. We'll now see the outcome of such a scenario. If the nucleophile were to add in here, these electrons would be flipped over here, forming a double bond there, and pushing these electrons up onto the oxygen. That would, of course, give me this intermediate right here. Now you can see that this intermediate is in resonance with this intermediate down here. These two resonance contributors together are known as enolates. If I then quench this reaction with acid, this negative charge gets protonated at the carbon to give me this compound, in which the nucleophile is actually added at the carbon that is beta to the carbonyl, instead of adding directly to the carbonyl itself, as we see in the direct or 1-2 addition up here. Now this type of reaction shown down here is called conjugate or 1,4 addition. It is also frequently referred to as Michael addition in honor of its discoverer, George Michael. <laughs> I'm just kidding, actually. The actual name of its discoverer was uh, Arthur Michael, a wealthy chemist from the early 20th century who I'm sure did somehow inspire George Michael's later music. I assume that probably many of my Younger students don't really have a clue who George Michael even is. <laughs> now the last question I need to answer is, which reagents favor 1-2 addition, and which ones favor 1-4 addition?
The answer is summarized in the following sentence, which I've modified from one taken directly from our class text. Nucleophiles that are weak bases, such as cyanide, thiols, amines, and bromide, prefer conjugate addition. Nucleophiles that are strong bases, such as R-, as you'd see in uh, alkyl lithiums, or Grignard reagents, or H-, as you'd see in sodium borohydride, or lithium aluminum hydride, prefer direct addition. Now here's something I want you to remember, I command and beg you to remember. Alkyl cuprates also prefer conjugate addition. So oddly enough, if you have an alkyl cuprate, even though it acts as if it were an R-, this is a type of reagent that allows you to add an alkyl group preferentially and almost exclusively at the beta position doing conjugate addition. So are you ready for some problems? Good. Here you go. First one, the following compound was prepared by a conjugate addition reaction between an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone and an alcohol. Identify the two reactants. And how could the following compounds be prepared from cyclohexanone? And what reagent would best accomplish the following transformation? We now arrive at our next synthetic transformation acid catalyzed decarboxylation. You see, if you have a carbonyl that's beta to a carboxylic acid group in your compound, you can remove the acid group by heating it up like this. You see I've got a carboxylic acid group right here, and I've got a carbonyl that's on the beta carbon relative to the carbonyl over here. If I heat that up, frequently I have to treat it with aqueous acid. What occurs the negative charge in here comes over here, closes this bond to form a double bond here. These electrons go up here and up here. You'll see that when the, this bond is closed, it forms carbon dioxide, CO2. The intermediate that's formed here has a double bond between these two carbons and a single bond with an O- up here. That then rearranges to form this enolate, which ultimately gets protonated in the quench. Now, as it turns out, this reaction only works if these electrons right here have an electron withdrawing group to go into. Thus, this reaction right here would not work. You can see that if I had this negative charge coming in here to form CO2 and this, uh, these electrons flipping over here, I've got no withdrawing group to go into. So this is not going to happen. I hope you got this. You got it? Good. Let's do some problems. I want you to identify which of the following molecules will undergo acid catalyzed decarboxylation and then draw the products formed. Now this feels like a wonderful place for us to conclude this lecture. So please take a break, eat some cereal or something, and then come back for our final special topics lecture in which we will cover acidity, basicity, and carbonyl condensation reactions. Until then, good day.